Thank you so much. I would like to talk about the Commons today and why this is not a choice but a um, reality we are facing already. In 1968, an uh, ecologist named Gareth Hardin wrote a paper that was called The Tragedy of the Commons, and this describes the problems that arise when shared resources are sort of plundered and privatized by individuals, thus causing everyone's ruin. And in game theory, this is a variation of the so-called prisoner's dilemma, whereby so-called rational and self-interested decisions for individuals turn out to basically ruin the ecosystem for everyone. And of course, a very important example of such dynamic today is the climate crisis, whereby individual states are incentivized to profit from other states' efforts and investments to go climate neutral because doing nothing and just basically profiting from other states' efforts is the most rational behavior for a single state and of course you have kind of the same situation today with the vaccination rate. Individuals try to externalize perceived risks and reap the profit from other people getting vaccinated and of course what happens is that crowd immunity is never reached and no one benefits. So these situations are examples of so-called social dilemmas, but they also show that the individual self-interest that is considered rational is in fact deeply irrational, bordering on sociopath behavior and societies can frankly no longer afford it, especially not in a situation of multiple crises such as today. So basically the main lesson for me from pandemia is that the commons are not some kind of communist delusion or anarchist fantasy. The commons are a factual reality because we happen to share an environment both in an immunological and an ecological sense, not even mentioning a social one. And if we don't accept it and keep incentivizing a self-interested libertarian attitude, then everyone will lose. So the commons are already a fact because humans are entangled with one another, with their environment and so on. And the questions of health and the environment cannot fundamentally be solved on the base of libertarian individualism. Which brings me to the question of modeling. And um, yeah, so this is a model I made. I started to work with social models as a sort of artistic genre at the beginning of pandemia. I'm trying to understand it as a medium and really work with them to see um, what happens, you know, in practice once you start working with them. And everyone knows Bono. No. I know what a social model is. It uh, is probably one way to estimate probabilities of infection. Um, and in scientific parlance, this kind of thing is called an agent-based simulation. Now, what is this simulation modeling? It's basically a mixture of a riot control model with an infection model. And I can just go ahead and effect one person in there and it will be affected by a strange illness which is contagious and which is a dancing mania. So, and I think that this is a, a very useful model to model any kind of infodemia, conspiracy theory, this kind of contagion happening over social media, for example, or other corporate networks. But in realizing it, I also realized that there is a lot of limitations to these kind of models. Because if you look at these parameters there, then you have, for example, parameters like government leg legitimacy or grievance or civil unrest. But you can crank them any way you want. The rebellion, even if it wins, will always end up with a lot of people running around very angry and not knowing what to do. You know, it looks like, like 
basically a normal Berlin Sunday out in the streets with a conspiracy protest happening. So in a way, we do not really learn anything from this model. It does not present any sort of perspective of way forward. We can basically model the status quo, the thing that happens, but for a metric like, for example, protest solidarity, which we put in, we squeezed, you know, into the existing code at the end, it doesn't really do much because the model is already geared toward a certain outcome. So, my question is really, the, these classical out-of-the-box models are lacking one metric, or so a lot of metrics, all of them have to do with cooperation, with solidarity, or any social value which is not based on sociopath self-interest. And I would like to apply this to the real life situation right now. I cannot escape this. Sorry. Okay, this is not working. Can you please help me to escape this? Okay, good, I have it. So let me show you this picture because I think that this really encapsulates the new now which embodies the title of the conference. This is a photo taken at the airport in Sarajevo. Sarajevo is always a good model to look at what's happening now. And you see it shows three clocks, one of which says Sarajevo, one London, one New York. In Sarajevo it's 12.15, in London it's 8.43, and in New York it's 9.35. None of these clocks work. And the artist who made this installation is called American Express. And I think that this is a really good way to understand where we are at now. The project of globalization is sort of stalled or um, at least halted, and we are back in a phase of neo feudal vernacularization where people are sort of stuck in their own small filter bubbles. Which reminds me of William Gibson's often quoted phrase that the future is everywhere, it's just not evenly distributed. And this, of course, also applies to Berlin, where one could say we do not only incorporate all these time zones, but even live within you know, different centuries all at the same time. Um, so, <laughs> One example is, of course, the airport. It's quite famous. It took 14 years to build, and when it was finally um, ready, it was obsolete already, which led me to come to the idea that Berlin has invented a whole new design style, namely obsolete design. You design something to be outdated by the time it is released. But then, of course, the Humboldt Forum came along and told the airport to just hold its beer, because for those who do not know what the Humboldt Forum is, it's a big, shiny, new museum full of looted art in fake feudalist style, which recently was opened, which took even longer to build and is even more obsolescent. So it seems that Berlin has adopted a similar attitude towards the internet, frankly. It seems that Berlin just wants to skip the phase of the internet and wait until it's over. <laughs> I don't know. I spent a year being a parent, you know, face to the Berlin education system during pandemia was frankly excruciating. How long do you think it took to connect Berlin's classrooms to the internet? Did it take maybe four weeks after the start of pandemia or even three months? For now, the projected date is 2025. By then, maybe all classrooms will be connected to the internet. But even for those classrooms that were actually connected to the internet, the internet wasn't used for distance learning because of privacy reasons. There is a saying in German, you're stuck between the plague and the cholera. And in a way, this is how I felt, because the solution cannot really be to either force Berlin students to become vector of infection or to have their data expropriated. This cannot really be the solution. 
Of course, all this is part of a set of larger problems. Elsewhere, you know, people talk about defunding the police, but Berlin has gone ahead for decades and defunded its public education system without a lot of debate. Um, not to speak of the health system, for example, and of course, basically the whole domestic labor of society ended up being defunded. The labor of creating and maintaining and improving life. And here I want to return to the metrics I showed you in my simulation because there seems to be something fundamentally wrong with the metrics which measure the success or the non-success of projects in this city. Uh, a focus on profitability over any other kind of metric. But then again, there's also be really great things happening in Berlin. For example, vaccination centers. I went and I got vaccinated in a place called Velodrome, which is a cycling center, which has a spectacular architecture under any circumstance. And I really had the feeling, you know, that a bunch of aliens took pity of this city and airlifted in a flying saucer full of, you know, friendly and helpful human beings eager to solve problems and to contribute. So it was uh, frankly unsettling, I have to say, but also quite wonderful because you could see how a public system could work and work very, very well when it's given the resources and the means to do it. And we had this attitude everywhere in the city during the whole pandemic. People wanted to contribute. There was this outburst of voluntary activities. And I also want to mention those people that were basically shut up at home for one and a half years, like my students, you know, who lost their jobs on everything, who basically wanted to com contribute, even though they were considered systemically irrelevant, and their contribution ended up not being counted, not being accounted for, not being valued, not being honored, which makes me think again that, you know, this metric needs to be implemented really to account for the type of mutual aid which is abundant in this city. And here's where I want to go back to the tragedy of the commons I mentioned in the beginning because it is definitely not inevitable. A Nobel Prize winner Eleanor Ostrom has shown, for example, that oftentimes the commons is managed quite well, actually, by bottom-up self-management of participants, for example, or irrigation systems, for example, water management, fisheries, and so on. But you could even mention something very, very trivial like the traffic in Italian cities, right? Where people just uh, move along in order to provide the best outcome for everyone. And um, I don't have time to go into these principles, but here they are. And of course, this made me think about my own type of modeling. What kind of modeling do we actually need? What kind of metrics do we actually need? And I came up with um, an implementation of this paper, <laughs> Climate Club Futures on the Effectiveness of Future Climate Clubs, which basically deals with the problem how to make climate treaties work, how to incentivize states to really take part. But I chose this type of agent here, which is which I call the communist Shiba Inu. And I made a completely different type of draft of metrics, uh, of, of of simulation which looks like this, which actually does have parameters like cooperation, mutual aid, and as an incentive, every time a so-called mutual aid event happens, you have a little polar bear cub dropped into the simulation, which I call the Knut matrix of mutual aid. So I think this should be enough as an incentive to consider such type of new alternative modeling, because the thing that has become abundantly clear is that the commons, whether one likes it or not, is already here, and we better start dealing with it. Thank you. <laughs>